And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Welcome to Open Connection, I'm your host, Robert Picto. Our show today comes to you from the unceded and traditional territory of the Simshan people. The first church-run Indian residential school opened in 1831. By the 1880s, the federal government had adopted an official policy of funding residential schools across Canada. The explicit intent was to separate these children from their families and cultures. We begin today's Open Connection with Maynard Angus at the recent Nation to Nation conference held in Thornhill. Just a kind of just a snapshot, and you've seen this in the media, uh, the 215 children that were discovered at the Kamloops Residential School. So it's hit the news and the conversation's been going on for quite some time in the communities. Um, I grew up where my uncles never talked about residential school. We never heard of residential school growing up. It wasn't even a conversation. Um, up until just a few years ago when uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was started where they wanted to tell their story and that's where the stories were told. And of course going to school in, in you know, elementary school, we'd read about the Ojibwe and we'd read about the, the First Nations on, on the other side of the country. But there was no conversation about the Jemsan people or the Gitsan people or the Wet'suwet'en or the Niska or the Haisla or the Haida. There was none of that conversation. Nobody talked about it. And so when the conversation started, not that it needed to be the flavor of the day, but it became the narrative in the boardroom. It became the narrative in the kitchen at home. The children are talking about it. And like I said, it's important for you to understand what happened. And when you start to understand what happened, it truly does change the conversation. It changes the way you think. You know, I, when I was in university, you know, you take some courses and one of them was on public relations. And the professor said, how do you change the mind of the public? There's only one way is you educate them. And so as an education for you to understand, and again, know this, that it truly is not your fault. And that is, again, I'll say that is, is very important for you to know that it's not your fault and that you shouldn't feel guilty about this. We do not want history to repeat itself, but we want you to understand. And when you begin to understand the narrative and the conversation, the conversation in the boardroom or in the council chambers or in a third space will begin to change. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Thanks for staying with us. At one point, it was the largest residential school in Canada, with up to 500 students attending at any given time. During her tenure as elected chief counselor, the remains of 215 children were found buried at the site of the former Kamloops Indian Residential School. Let us return to the conversation with Cook P. Roseanne from Swepnik. I'm Cook P. Roseanne Kasmer Winsquest at the Kamloops de Swepnik. I'm very very honored to be here with all of you and sharing with you um, our journey from 215 to now and some of the steps that we've taken and the many steps that we still have to take and those are taken together i you know want to um, express my honor to be here on the direct ancestral lands of the shimshian because I'm coming from the Columbus of Shwetmik with it, which is from the Shwetmik Nation uh, in um, here. So what has happened was truly 
beyond imagination. It was something, being in leadership, I never thought would ever, you know, be a part of my leadership and the role that I had to step up to. And the people that had to rely on me and that I relied on as well. And that is our survivors and our intergenerational survivors and our people and everyone that was impacted from Indian Residential School. It was very painful. And for so many, it was like a band-aid that was being ripped off, an old wound that was still very much alive to this day and has never been resolved. So I do think, you know, the Indian Residential School Survivors Society for all their support that they have provided. And I really truly thank Arlene for being here today. And I thank her for sharing, you know, their role. And it was those areas of resources that we relied heavily on um, within our community. And so it was just extremely crucial. So I'm gonna share with you some of the reflections and um, that have happened and share some most recent information as well, um, you know, within community, but also within um, what's happening with uh, the band class um, that is currently going on right now. So I'll be providing a little bit of context of a lot of things um, and, and look forward to sharing that with all of you. So looking at this year past year, um, you know, we had the first anniversary of the Lis Way. The Lis Way is our Shwetmek term for the missing. And they're the children who did not come home. We held a ceremony May 23rd to honor and to give dignity and to share reflections and express so much gratitude for everyone who stood with us together in unity and in solidarity from far and wide. And, you know, and uplifting our elders and our survivors directly from the Helen Indian Residential School right within the heart of the community. So today, you know, we continue to support um, that as we move forward, you know, the families who are still seeking answers. There's still a lot of unanswered questions and we know that this journey together, we know it's gonna be very long. There is also no rule book and we're gonna be working to find answers that are needed for real actions towards reconciliation. And it's gonna take a lot of work. We know that, especially how far we've made it so far to this day. One thing is for sure is that we are truly steadfast in our focus on healing and reclamation of family ties, our culture, and our language. And, you know, I just really wanted to also express my gratitude for the, even the UN, you know, declaring this decade of um, language and culture revitalization. That is something that is so important to us, especially knowing the, the impact that it has had on our, our identities. So our nations as collectives, we know we're damaged by the impacts of the Indian Residential School, arising from the forced removal of children from our communities and the harms that flowed right from the loss of that culture. So last year, there was also a settlement for the Day Scholars and the parties. We entered into a settlement regarding the claims of Day Scholars and their children, but the black band class, um, you know, is still within the courts to this day and in discussions. And there's been some recent developments. We also thank and appreciate the provincial and federal leaders for being alongside, you know, many of our First Nation leaders whose communities were impacted from unmarked graves. Ever since our 215, so many communities, um, just in BC alone, there's 18 residential schools and three Indian hospitals. And all the work that they're doing to find answers as well. And right across the nation, we've seen many, many communities do similar work and have similar findings. And they too as well want answers. They wanna know why family did not come home. So it is a good example, you know, with the leadership that has supported us, you know, with various forms of funding and advocation. We've seen um, that support 
and we, we see that support is going to be needed for, for some time. We also know that it is also a good example of the importance of real hope for real change. And only together we can do that. Um, I'll share a little bit about the Roman Catholic Church and, and the importance of them also taking responsibility and making amends. Um, I was um, very honored to be asked to be one of the delegates from British Columbia across the nation, as a matter of fact, to be able to go to the Vatican, to Rome, and to speak to the Pope directly about the harms caused by the Indian Residential School, but most importantly, the role of the Roman Catholic system. So I was one of 13 First Nation delegates to go, and it was truly historical. It was an honor to represent the province and carrying the truths of our survivors you know, to be a part of that delegation that spoke to residential schools, unmarked graves, truth and reconciliation, and the importance of a meaningful papal apology, and the importance of that visit to be here on Turtle Island, here on our soils. And how important it is to heal and to work towards reconciliation. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Welcome back to Open Connection. For a great many survivors, talking about their experiences in residential schools means reliving their traumas they experience. For years, many told no one about what they endured. Let us return the conversation as Roseanne shares how the Pope reacted to a pair of children's moccasins. For residential schools and Mark Graves, those impacts have left all of us with deep wounds. The loss, the ties to the families, and for the many that thought that the abuse was also normal. As adults, there have been a lot of unresolved trauma and many suffer from issues from family life, intimacy, low self-esteem, and we see those impacts all around us when we look at the opioid crisis, the increase of mental health, and how devastating that's been on you know, our communities, into the municipalities where many of our people you know, also resign. And it's something that we have to work and strive together it is so important because, you know, we see those interactions that have with the police. We also see that um, those high experiences of racial discrimination and those negative ways of how trauma is being coped with. So when I went to the Pope, it was provided, um, the Pope was provided with a pair of moccasins so that the father himself could, you know, take them and reflect on them and to bring them back to Turtle Island. When he came here, he did bring those moccasins back and he truly did reflect and he brought that back to one of our survivors who brought that there as part of the delegation. And it was for honoring the survivors and those who did not return. And he returned them. And you know, when we think about that papal visit here to Canada, he did address each of those key, key areas that we brought forth, but kind of spread it out throughout his journey from Cowess's First Nation, um, actually, sorry, Muscogee's First Nation, and to Lake Saint Anne, and back east over there in, in Montreal, and even spoke about genocide on the airplane. So we know that there's definitely been some meaningful steps forward. And, but holding that whole, the church accountable for the role is also, you know, something that is going to be necessary for the acknowledgement of the past, but working with them and how important that is going to be to move forward. So there are many next steps. So we need, you know, that mandate and that commitment from the highest level and that's to be passed down to the local diocese. 
I've been seeing and witnessing a lot of that work taking place locally within the Schwabach Nation. I have had the local diocese reaching out, and I know that they are hosting a retreat here in the first week of October. And it is about towards um, truth and reconciliation and the harms caused by the Roman Catholic um, Church as well with residential school. And to me, that is important because it's a step. It's a step forward in acknowledging, it's a step forward in knowing that we have to do that together. And, um, you know, we know that forgiveness, it is a very personal choice, but we also know that it cannot be ignored as well because the power of an apology can be powerful for, for some. And for some, it may not be, but for many, it gives that hope. There are still many truth and reconciliation calls to action that needs to be implemented, which means that there are a lot of work that we need to be doing together, both locally and nationally. And we also want, you know, respect for our First Nation rights demonstrated through the abolishment, you know, the colonial laws and the papal bull and the doctrines. We know that they all assert superiority over who we are, and we've seen it when it came to our lands. So there's a lot of discussions that need to take place. Healing, we know that will come with revitalization and the reclamation of our identity, our laws, our spirituality. And we know that the church also has to commit with that work moving forward. Um, we brought many of our elders, you know, to Edmonton as part, to be a part of, and also to witness the experience of the Holy See. And, you know, people thought, well, what do you think of his apology? Well, I want and I hope that people do see this as a meaningful step. For myself, taking that journey was very difficult to go to the Vatican. It was difficult, so difficult because of the trauma that it has impacted our people. And knowing that I was carrying so many messages you know, from our, our survivors and our intergenerational survivors and our leaders and them sharing their pain with me and the weight that I and all our delegates had to carry was difficult. Open Connection will be right back after these messages. And now, from the CFTK TV studios, this is Open Connection with your host, Robert Picto. Ceremony is an essential part of traditional Indigenous healing because physical and spiritual health are intimately connected. Mind and spirit must heal together. In this final segment, Roseanne shares how ceremony kept her grounded. There's like so many different um, things that I carried and it was a lot. And for me, no matter what, you know, that's something I wanted to share and express is the importance of ceremony and personal grounding and being in tune with who you are and with the creator. That grounding is what got me through it. You know, just when you think that you just can't handle anymore, um, just before the trip going to Rome, um, oh yes, I'm also the Shwetmak Nation tribal chief as well for our Shwetmak Nation within Shwetmakulu. Um, I was told that the one weekend I had to plan and prepare, the only weekend that I had to plan and prepare to go to the Vatican, that I also had a role to play within our Schwebeck Nation gathering. So I thought, you know what, I take my role very serious, I'll go, and I thought, you know, I, things will work out the way it's meant to work out, and I'll be taking what I need to take when I go. So I went, but it was the most amazing experience and so exactly what I needed because it was really, it was about our culture and it was about our elders and it was about our youth and our, our cultural support workers all being together. And it was a grounding that I needed. Many spoke the language, many, you know, shared their prayers their gift of laughter and the importance of healing and how we need to be working towards that. But most importantly was to know that um, I was in the right path and what I was doing and where I was going. And the love that I felt was incredible and I needed that. And I had 
probably at least a dozen of our our um, spiritual workers praying and brushing me off in a good traditional cultural way that I needed because I had a journey to do. I had a role to, and a responsibility to fulfill and I had to be that voice for our people. So I did it with a lot of honor and dignity and that extra bit of strength was exactly what I needed and that's what carried me. Um, so today, you know, I know that we're also embarking on a path, you know, that honors true constitutional path towards inclusivity. You know, that's something that is also quite huge when we're looking at, you know, the importance of being uplifted together and that jurisdictional piece and recognizing government to government and the importance of it. We also know that, um, you know, I also just wanted to acknowledge that it took many years to assess the impact of the discovery of the unmarked graves. There are significant steps that are important um, for youth representatives, you know, for our youth. When we think about our youth, it's so important for them to have the future that they need to thrive and fulfill their destinies. And I know that as leaders and as our elders, everything that we do is for our future generations and those not yet born. So that is something we always have to keep at the forefront. Um, with the truth and reconciliation, um, for those that you know are not too intimately familiar with it, the messaging on that truth and reconciliation commission included explaining those calls to action, the 10 principles to advance reconciliation, and those calls to justice for the murdered and missing indigenous women and girls. It is expected also that UNDRIP will be used as a framework towards that reconciliation. We know that our treaties or our agreements with government, they're constitutional and human rights must be respected. It was explained that the reconciliation process, it is not a destination. It is something that needs implementation. There is also need to look to other forms of reconciliation as we move forward to the future, because there's so many areas that we've all been impacted. Those impacted want to be heard, respected, and ensure that no one that is left behind. And those impacted want to be heard, respected, and ensure. Examples of the day scholars who were left out of the residential school system, and the 60s scoop, and the need for child legislation those which are all at the forefront. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada was also created through an illegal settlement between the residential school survivors, the Assembly of First Nations, the Inuit representatives, and the parties responsible for the creation and operation of the schools, the federal government and the church as well. The mandate was to inform all Canadians about what happened in residential schools. The TRC documented the truth of survivors, their families, their communities, and anyone personally affected by the residential school experience. This included the First Nations, the Inuit, and the Métis, and all the former residential school students, and their families, and their communities, the churches, the former school employees, government officials, and other Canadians. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Open Connection. The greatest distance in the existence of man is not from here to there, but the connection from his mind to his heart. If we can conquer that distance, we can soar like an eagle and realize our immensity within. I'm Robert Pictel.